My coffee's going cold and I haven't even started. Okay. Hello everybody, it's Sylvie. Welcome or welcome back to Tarot Magpie. I hope you're doing good. I hope you're ready for the third installment in my collection series of videos that I am doing this January, right at the start of 2024, to assess the state of my collection and do a little deck inventory. This video is my mass market tarot decks, so I've already done a video with all of my oracle decks, a video with all of my indie tarot decks, and today is all my mass market tarot decks. This is going to be the longest one, I think. Next week I've got my tarot book collection, which might actually be longer than I think it is, but I think today is the biggest category, so grab a snack, grab a drink, get cosy, and let's have a nosy at my collection. As with previous installments, there is no order to how I am showing you these tarot decks because that is simply too much to orchestrate, but I am doing my kind of bigger box decks to start with so that I don't forget about them. So first up, we have the Fyodor Pavlov Tarot. This uh, was an indie deck and is relatively new to the mass market, but this is a mass market edition that was published by US Games last year. This is a very luxe deck. It's reflected in the price, unfortunately, but the cardstock is delicious. It's got this um, really nice, actually, hardcover guidebook. The illustrations are wonderful. This is a beautiful deck. It's a really clear reader. I'm so glad that I have this deck in my collection. This is one of my favorite strength cards of all time. I just think it's beautiful. I love the colors. I love that she's got like plate armor on. This is also a, a queer created and representing queer people, uh, this deck. And I think I really enjoy that. I think that is, you know, always needed. We always need decks that re represent an authentic, diverse collection of people, which uh, this deck definitely does do a job of doing. Um, and I love this vicious looking Queen of Swords. We know I love a vicious Queen of Swords. So this is the first mass market deck in my collection. I think I have a walkthrough of this one. As with the previous videos, I will list all of the decks in the description below and I will list if they are out of print and I will also link any unboxing walkthrough type videos if I've got them on my channel. All right, next up, this one is actually, these Llewellyn big boxes are, are almost too big. Uh, this is the Tarot of Vampires by Ian Daniels. It's a Llewellyn deck. This is the earlier big box vampire deck. I know they came out with one last year, which I really am not a fan of the look of. Um, but that's that's an opinion that doesn't really matter too much. I feel like I've spoken about this one a fair bit recently. I worked with this during Scorpio season. It was my daily deck pull and then I was reading a snippet from the guidebook. I just adore this. I think when I first came across this, I was a little bit put off by, I guess by the art style because it's not my like go-to preferred art style. It's not the art style I would like have in my house or, you know, you know what I mean? Like it's not super my aesthetic. And so initially whenever I first saw this deck years ago, I was, I kind of dismissed it at first. Um, but I've come back around clearly. I love this. I love how even if the art style is not particularly my personal aesthetic, um, I love how committed it is. Like it really, it really goes all in on it. Like the art style is what it is. The theme of the deck, everything is really cohesive. Everything works really well. And the images are fantastic. You can see there's, um, oh, I'll struggle to find it now. But we have the astrological glyphs in all of the cards except apparently this Prince of Grails I can't find it but um like here it's got loads of information in there the guidebook is fantastic um this is gonna like you can see I've, I've tabbed bits and there's, there's bits of underlining when I was doing a daily pull with this deck I have not read the guidebook in its entirety I am not done studying this deck I was just doing like a, a low-key practice with it 
during skill PA season and it's oh it's stunning and I think even if like I say this is not my personal aesthetic although at some point when I was a teenager this would have been I would have been all over this this would have been the dream the fact that it is so cohesive and it is so intentional like there's themes there's the aesthetic there's the kind of vibe that it's going for it's very esoteric you can see the imagery is quite dark and grungy and sexy and I wouldn't necessarily say that this is a dark deck to read like and I found that actually the guidebook goes into a lot of detail and a lot of depth but it does tend to focus on the more positive or more productive I guess like more productive aspects of the cards like even some of the cards that are traditionally a little bit more doom and gloom that's not what is focused on in this deck so visually aesthetically it's very dark and like moody but I don't find it's that as a reading experience but it is quite an intense reading experience and I think that is aided by the fact that this this book is a mine of information there's there's a lot going on and there's a lot to it's got a lot of depth to it all right in a bit of a um 180 this is another Llewellyn big box deck when did this come out I think it was oh it came out in 2020 okay I love the aesthetic of this but it is less deep <laughs> so whereas the vampire tarot is like the aesthetic is not instantly my something I'd be drawn to it has a lot of depth to it and I love the reading experience this this is the darkwood tarot I can't believe I haven't actually said that this is the darkwood tarot the aesthetic is beautiful Sasha Graham the no sorry Abigail Larson is the artist she has illustrated a few different decks I've got two of them I adore her art style it is it is dark fairy tale in the in just such a such a good way I just love it I think her art's fantastic so aesthetically this is like on point for me this is the kind of dark and moody deck aesthetic that I would be drawn towards but the reading experience of this is actually a little bit less deep and intricate complex layered something like that than the Tower of Vampires but I still do enjoy reading with this I also did a monthly uh, practice a month-long practice with this one where I was pulling a card and reading the guidebook and I do really enjoy it I do like the guidebook there is a lot in here that I really enjoy but this one is is trying to be like it's called the dark word tarot this is trying to be a little bit more dark and shadowy like that's the intention behind the book and I think it just there's something about it it doesn't fall short exactly it's a good deck I really enjoy it but I kind of wish there was just a little bit more to it and then I think it would really you know be a 10 out of 10 dark shadowy kind of deck but all that being said it is gorgeous and um I like having it in my collection and in going through it now I'm realizing that I have been neglecting this deck and that I really want to play with it all right this is the Hieronymus Bosch Tarot by Travis McHenry this one is published by Rockpool I believe there are a couple of other Bosch decks out in the world this one came out in 2022 I think mass market but it was an indie kickstarter deck before that I believe but you know this is the mass market video this is the mass market edition I would say this is one of my favorite boxes I just think it's so it's just so satisfying like usually I would prefer a tuck box any day than all this empty space but this one gets a pass I did a flip through of this deck when I first got it as well it is all artwork taken from Hieronymus Bosch's Garden of Earthly Delights and this is the tarot completely reworked you can see we have different suits than in like we've got berries different suits than in the traditional tarot there is a major arcana and then there are lots of suits of just kind of expanded courts. It's really interesting. We also have these keywords, which have resulted in me using this more like an oracle than like a tarot because it's a whole different system. It isn't the traditional 78 tarot. And I'm really intrigued by that system, but there's so much that I want to learn. There's so much that I want to dive into with tarot, learning this very specific system for this very specific deck that I'm not going to be able to translate into other decks that's a little bit lower on my priorities list but 
it's extremely cool. I love the artwork. I love historical artwork decks. I've got a few that you'll be seeing in this video and it's, it's weird and wonderful because it's Hieronymus Bosch's artwork and um, I do really like it and I'm glad to have it in my collection even if it doesn't see a whole lot of use. I have here The Dreams of Gaia Tarot by Ray Raven Falan and this, who published this? Blue Angel. I know there have been a couple of different editions of this deck and I got this one off eBay so I don't know if this is the currently available edition but this is the larger box with the bigger guidebook because this is a deck that I want to study and dive into. This deck is still in order and you will not be surprised to learn that I have not yet done my proposed deep dive study of this deck. Um, again, I have, I have lofty goals and the same amount of time as any other human person, unfortunately. Uh, this is another deck that I've seen floating around for years and I think whenever I first saw it years ago, I was like, no, that's not my preferred art style aesthetic, so I'm not interested. And then it took a few years for me to kind of discover it again. And I'm I'm just really intrigued by it. There's something about this is kind of cheesy. Let's be real. It's kind of cheesy, kind of like, it's got that like Wiccan-ish love and light, nature loving kind of, kind of vibe to it. Like being one with the earth, all that like, which... As a, as a general philosophy is not the way I tend to go or is not the um, the tone I tend to take but I still think this deck is from what I've seen of it and from what I've heard people say about it I think it's like valuable in its own right I do actually think the art is really gorgeous although like again like the vampire's tarot it's not it's not the art that I would create it's not the art that I would like hang in my home but I still think it's really beautiful in its own right I love this card and this also has its own system, which is why I have not yet worked with it. You can see we've got some additional major cards as well. And really, I have nothing more to say about this because I have not worked with it yet. I have just flipped through. I've read bits of the guidebook. Um, but yeah, that is the Dreams of Gaia Tarot, which, you know, this year is going to be the year I'm going to work with it. The Dungeons and Dragons Tarot deck. This came out in 2022, I think. Um, I don't know if there's been other editions or other other Dungeons and Dragons Tarot decks either before or since. Um, but this is the official Dungeons and Dragons Tarot deck. And I got this because I'm a fantasy. I'm a fantasy D and D RPG kind of person and the art is the same artist I assume but definitely the same art style as you get in the official like D&D handbooks and stuff which I think is just a really beautiful art style so I have this as a to sit in the collection deck do I read with this no not really um there is a newer edition which has the suits on the minor cards as you can see this just says 10 and you're like 10 of what exactly and off the top of my head I'm not sure what this is and I would have to look it up in the guidebook but I think it's really beautiful. I love all the references to D&D and I have used this, I haven't used this for a like a traditional straightforward tarot reading, I have used this to come up with backstory ideas for like characters in campaigns that I've played and I think there's some in the guidebook there's some ways that you can use this to create like encounters and stuff so you have, it's a it's a very sparse guidebook in terms of tarot meanings. You've just got a little colour image and then you've got the briefest meaning of the card and then also um, like encounters or things that can happen if you were playing a game of D&D. So you could use this to kind of structure, a, structure an encounter in a campaign and it gives you sort of events that might happen. Um, I haven't used it like that because I don't DM, but I think that's pretty cool. And you know, I'm a D&D, I'm a D&D person. So I had to have this in my collection and I edged it in black myself. It doesn't come like this. Um, but yeah, the newer edition does have the suit names. So it would be a bit easier to read as a tarot deck. I think this one is the three of the, three of the 
pentacles equivalent, but the suits have also been renamed. So it like is very much more a D&D thing than it is a tarot deck, if that makes sense. It's for the D&D nerds, not for the tarot nerds. Okay, the Bonefire Tarot, second edition. This came out last year. I have a walkthrough, up, a really long walkthrough up on my channel, actually. Um, that ended up being a really long video because I had a lot to say about it. I played with pears, I looked at the guidebook, I did all sorts. Um, this, oh god, first of all, these red edges are beautiful and I really like the size of this deck, but have I used it much? No, because the borders, or the lack of borders, I just find it a bit visually overwhelming, having lots of cards laid out together. Do you see what I mean? Like it's a lot. I think the art is beautiful. Some of the cards have been updated since the first mass market edition of this deck. Um, I forget which ones exactly, but one of them is the chariot. This is, ooh, this is new art for this edition of the deck. And I love this chariot so much that I was semi considering getting the first edition with the black borders and moving this edition along but I love this card so much I don't want to get rid of it so this is what I have for the time being <laughs> and I think actually this is going to be my Aries season daily pull because of the of the fire and the fiery nature but as of yet I have not really worked with this too much I've just flipped through it because I love the artwork there are so many details I think the guidebook is really cool too the guidebook really goes into a lot of the uh, the symbols and the details in this artwork because obviously it's a Rider Waite Smith system, but the artwork is is very different to Pamela Coleman Smith's artwork. There's a lot of additional symbols, especially with it being the Bone Fire Tarot. There's a lot of bones. There's a lot of flames. There's a lot of recurring, um, like there's dice and stuff and and gems and some chakra bits in here as well. Like there's a lot going on, but the guidebook does actually expand on that and tell you what everything means which I really really appreciate. This is also one of my favourite Ten of Cups cards of all time so we will leave it there. This might be my last big bulky deck. This is the Herb Crafters Tarot which I spoke about recently in maybe my five tarot decks video as a deck that I've been neglecting um, or a deck that I haven't worked with and that kind of inspired me to start working with it. So I've been using this as my Capricorn season daily pull, pulling a card, reading the guidebook. I am absolutely falling in love with this deck. First off, I think the artwork is beautiful. I've always thought the artwork is beautiful, but I was just a little bit intimidated because I don't have a lot of herbal knowledge. And also the creators of this deck are from... I want to say South America somewhere, but off the top of my head, I've forgotten. Point being, a lot of these plants are not plants that I see in my everyday life. So that was like another barrier to entry almost. Because not only do I not have a lot of herbal knowledge, I definitely don't have a lot of herbal knowledge about plants that don't exist in my environment because I live in England, which is a very different climate. <laughs> but um, I kind of decided to get over that. And just start pulling a card every day, reading the guidebook, and I am falling so in love with this. I think the guidebook is fantastic. This is definitely one of those decks which, on its own, personally, I didn't feel like I was getting the most out of the images alone. And, you know, we have the title of the card and then the plant that is in the image. I didn't feel like I was getting much out of the images alone, gorgeous though they are. But the guidebook, it really does, it sets the scene, it tells you what's happening in this scene that's being depicted and then it tells you how the plant relates to the meaning of the card and the guidebook entries are pretty short it's a page per card so we've got what's happening in the card and then what the card means and how the plant relates to it and it's written so so well and then we also have some like I, I guess like key takeaways and then how you could craft with the energy of this card with the plant that's being shown and you can see I've kind of been tabbing as I go because there's some bits I've just really really liked either some bits that have been how they've been explained or some of these practices I think are really cool and I think something I would like to 
maybe try at some point. So I'm really enjoying this. I'm also really enjoying kind of path working a little bit with these cards. Path working is not something that I've done a lot of in my tarot time, but I pull this card for the day and then if I can't sleep, I do a little bit of like, it's not, I suppose, it might not be true path working, but I do a little bit of, of meditation path working type stuff if I can't sleep, um, you know, on the image that's shown in the card and the energies of the card. And that's been really enjoyable too. So I'm just absolutely falling in love with this deck. I'm really, really glad that I decided to get over myself and pick it up and give it a go. All right, moving swiftly on, I'm pulling decks pretty much at random, but the next two are my halloween -y seasonal decks that have been put away on a different shelf. This is the Halloween Tarot in a Tin Mini Edition, um, created by Kipling West. It's a US games deck. And this deck is not out of print, as far as I'm aware, but it always seems to be difficult to get hold of. And I think that's because I'm in the UK and buying US games decks in the UK is just always a problem. But I got this um, in 2023 because there was a cheap copy available to me. So I went for it. Um, the suits have been changed. We've got the three of bats instead of swords. We've got pumpkins instead of pentacles, ghosts instead of cups and something for ones, imps for the wands suit. There's a little black cat in every single card and it's just this gorgeous like storybook Halloween-y illustration style. It's so cute. This one lived in my handbag heading up to October, heading up to October, heading up to Halloween. Um, I pulled this out a lot. It was just, it's a really, it's a really fun deck and yeah, I love her. I love Halloween, you know, it's gay Christmas. So <laughs> I just think it's really cool. Next up, I've got the Buffy Tarot. This came out, uh, this is Titan Books, which I think is Insight Editions. I think Insight Editions is an imprint of Titan Books, I guess. Um, and this isn't specific to Halloween, but for me, it feels like a Halloween deck. Um, and this, I, I really enjoyed working with this in the run up to Halloween. I did a lot of my daily readings with it. And this is actually such a good, like, first of all, if you're a Buffy fan, it's a really good deck because it's Buffy. But also the scenes that were chosen for each of the cards and the characters that were chosen are really, really well done. And I know it can be very, very hit or miss with fandom decks, but I think this one was done really, really well. I don't know how well it would read if you're not a fan of the show, to be quite honest, because yeah, like looking at this, if you didn't know what the magic box was then that wouldn't really give you a lot but oh I love this um this is a really cute really fun deck I like the art style I love the color palette I hate the cardstock because it's insight editions and it's this weird like punch cut like I don't know if you can see there's like a lip at the edge of the card or it's been cut and so it shuffles I have to shuffle it like instead of instead of riffling it this way, I have to riffle it upside down because it clumps up otherwise. So this isn't strictly a Halloween deck, but I think I'm using it as more of a Halloween deck. And maybe that's just because the like monster of the week and the Halloween episodes give me that. That's the most memorable thing about Buffy to me or one of the most memorable things about Buffy as a TV series. Anyway, it's this like monster of the week, Halloween-y kind of vibe. So who do we have here? Ah, this is the Soul Cast Tarot. It is a Llewellyn deck. It's one of those big box decks, but I have obviously taken it out of the box because I didn't think the guidebook was worth much. I'm going to be really honest. I got very little of value out of the guidebook. I haven't read the whole thing to have a cover to cover, so, you know, pinch of salt, but I just wasn't really a fan. The artwork though, absolutely gorgeous. This is illustrated by Adam Olas, who has illustrated the like Oak Ash and Thorn, Smoke Ash and Ember, the Thistledown Oracle, all the Three Trees decks. 
um, is his illustration work. So it's the same, it's the same art style. They're very, very beautiful. I love me some cats. I love me an animal deck. I love how playful this is and how it is, even though you've got these little scenes set up that is obviously not how these animals would behave in real life. And even though there was like a Puss in Boots reference somewhere, like this is very Puss in Boots to me. Despite all that, the overall kind of vibe of the deck is still that it's cats being cats, even though there's this like mystical element to it. I think the idea is that the soul cats are not normal cats. I don't know. It felt very like like star CD, but for cats, which was a weird vibe. But anyway, I think the illustrations are gorgeous. But because the guidebook, it didn't leave a bad taste in my mouth. I just was a bit disappointed. I feel like I haven't really reached for this since and I think I just need to get over myself and start working with it on its own and then decide whether it's staying or going because it's really beautiful but I don't want I don't want decks taking up space that could be you know empty. Um, <laughs> I'm thinking maybe because the colour palette is giving me like late summer but I also think, and obviously there's lots of autumn vibes, like it's late summer autumn, but I think it might be nice in spring as well. Something about the juxtaposition of like the lengthening spring days and the days getting warmer and lighter with this like twilight autumnal artwork. I think that might be cool to work with. So, right, this, I think this is the golden tarot that I chopped down so it doesn't live in its box anymore. No, that's a lie. This is the Raven's Prophecy. The next one will be the Golden Tarot. So I've edged this in this fabulous orange to match the cards. Uh, this is the Raven's Prophecy Tarot by, it's a Llewellyn Big Box deck again. I don't know why this one isn't in its box because I do use the guidebook for this one. I think I just hate the big boxes, um, but I need to decorate these before I put any more decks in them. <laughs> Anyhow, I really love this deck. Sorry, hopefully that fixes the lighting situation a little bit. Uh, I really love this deck. This is by Maggie Stiefvater and the cards are based on, they inhabit the same world as her Raven Cycle book series. I don't think you need to have read that book series to read with this deck, but it will make a whole lot more sense if you have. I love this star card. Like it's so beautiful and it's so like stripped back like it's not it's not pips in the traditional sense but it's definitely not like narrative scenic artwork it's really interesting and um it's really really beautiful I love the book series by the way the Raven Cycle is is a favorite book series of mine and so I love this deck because of that but I also love this deck in its own right because I think it's really beautiful I think the guidebook works really really well with this deck and I say that because divorced from this deck it's it's a pretty tarot 101 kind of guidebook like the meanings are pretty tarot 101 for the most part if I remember correctly but it works so well with this deck which sounds obvious and it should because it was written for this deck but I don't know I don't think I'm articulating that very well but I've come across guidebooks which are really good guidebooks that you could use with any deck and then I've come across like with the soul cats that guidebook was specific to that deck but I didn't get anything out of it the guidebook for this one explains this deck really well to the point that if you haven't read the books the raven cycle I think you would be fine just with the guidebook and you'd understand everything um but yeah like this lovely do you see what I mean like it's such stripped back sparse imagery but I think it's so evocative I also have really come to love the giant orange borders <laughs> um oddly all the orange and black you think would be like Halloween vibes but it's not this is summer to me it's lovely this isn't even the golden tarot this is this really should be in its box I'm not sure why it's not um, oh yeah, I know I do. It's because it's in a different basket of decks I want to study. This is the Goddess of Love Tarot. This came out in September of 2023, so it's it's pretty recent release. I love this deck so much. 
this, who published this? I'm not sure, but the creator is Gabriella Herstick and the art was done by Snakes for Hair. Why I can remember that, I don't know. I say that, I've probably got it wrong. But, um, and this is a deck based on love and sex magic and love and sex goddess goddesses. I love this for the artwork. It's, I think this analog collage style is beautiful. I love all the roses. I love all the ocean. I love all the, the seashells and the pearls. I think it's so, so beautiful. I also really appreciate how although this is a very goddess heavy very feminine heavy deck it doesn't give me the like divine feminine ick that I get <laughs> do you know what I mean there's a lot of decks books pieces of writing things that people say um about the divine feminine that make me feel like a bit uncomfy this deck doesn't do that and the guidebook of what I've read also doesn't do that. Um, it doesn't make me feel uncomfortable with the way that it discusses femininity. So that was a little rambling of mine, but um, I think it's really beautiful. I, I just, I love the artwork. I think it's very Rider Waite Smith based in the meanings in the guidebook. And I think although the artwork is quite abstract, this Queen of Swords, to me at least, I find that it, like this reads like a Five of Pentacles, even though it looks nothing like the Rider Waite Smith Five of Pentacles, I can look at this and I'm like, yeah, absolutely, that's a Five of Pentacles. That's a Three of Cups. The energy is correct. The courts have been changed, so we still have queens, but we have witches for knights, crones for kings, and I think it's princesses for the pages. It's so beautiful. And the guidebook also for the major arcana, the guidebook has rituals, like ideas for rituals, like a little bit like the herb crafter that I showed. It had ideas for how you can work with the energy of each card. The guidebook for the goddess of love tarot has ritual ideas for the energies of each of the major arcana, Ooh. Uh, which is really cool. Like it's, it's really, it's really cohesive. It's really well thought out. It doesn't feel like it was just slapped together to fit a brief. It feels like a deck that was envisioned and was a bit of a labor of love. And I really appreciate seeing that, especially in mass market decks, because I know there's there are so many tarot decks being released at the moment. And a lot of them can feel a little bit redundant, a little bit rushed, whereas this this should exist in my opinion, <laughs> um, for whatever my opinion is worth. So, right, this one really should be the golden tarot. I'm trying to go to my like fabric -y bag type stuff out the way. Um, yes, this is the golden tarot by Cat Black. This is the glossy first edition and I have trimmed this. I've trimmed this and I've edged it in this tan color to kind of match the backs. It used to have borders that had this print um, you know, bordering the artwork, which I found made it just look very brown. <laughs> and I found it kind of drowned out the other colours, like the blues of the skies. There's some, some pinks in a lot of these decks, but because it is, um, oh god, I want to say late medieval, early renaissance. That could be entirely wrong. Like, there is a lot of brown to these images, but there are also these really lovely pops of blue, and some like really lovely bright colours and I found that the brown borders just really muted those in a way that I didn't love so I chopped the borders off. There is a second edition in a linen finish, this is US Games deck, so I don't know if you can still get this glossy edition but I also don't know why you'd want to when there's a linen <laughs> edition available. <laughs> um, this is a historical artwork deck, like I said, I, I like a historical artwork deck and I really like this one. This is the deck that I did a lot of my learning on. It's not the first deck I bought. I will show you that one next. But this is, I, I learnt the, um, the, the Rider Waite Smith with this deck, more or less. Um, it's a very faithful 
Rider Waite Smith copy. It is digitally collaged together out of existing artwork. I think it's really skillfully done. I don't think it looks too clunky and awkward. Um, and to be honest, a lot of medieval Renaissance art already looks clunky and awkward with the way that people are posed and body proportions and things. So I think it works. Anyway, Cat Black has another deck out, the Touchstone Tarot, which is Baroque art, I think. And I want that one. I want to add it to the collection, but I'm not in a, a huge hurry because I have a few historical artwork decks. Anyhow. All right, so my first ever tarot deck. Was this my first ever tarot deck? I'm not sure, actually. No, this must have been my first ever tarot deck. Um, Ill-advised is the Mary L. <laughs> this is uh, whatever edition had the black borders, which I have been slowly wearing away because I've used this deck so much. Or at least this was the first tarot deck I, when I decided I wanted to take tarot seriously, this is the first deck I bought. I wouldn't necessarily recommend it because it is not strictly following the Rider Waite Smith or the Thoth, although I think it's a bit more Thothy than it is Rider Waite. But um, I just, I loved and I still do. The artwork is so, so stunning. I believe these are oil paintings that she created. And I just think it's fascinating. I don't understand, I'm going to be honest, I still don't really understand this deck. When I read with it, I need the guidebook. I need to really sit there and decipher what the deck is trying to tell me. It is not an easy, straightforward reader by any stretch, but I love it. I think it's beautiful. And I am very glad that I have it. And I'm not, I'm not mad that it was my first ever deck, even though, like I say, I would not necessarily recommend it. It is the deck that I got when I decided to take that tarot seriously and it kind of kick-started my tarot journey and I certainly wouldn't have that any other way. This edition with the black edges, I don't think you can get any more, but I'm certain that the deck is still in print mass market. So you can get a copy of this deck. We have another deck in another scarf. This is the Horror Tarot, which is, I believe this is also an Insight Editions deck, but I don't have it in the box because I don't particularly care for the guidebook. Um, so I couldn't tell you. I edged this in this odd brown colour, which was a choice, and I think I might go over it with red someday. This is illustrated by Abigail Larson, who illustrated the Darkwood Tarot, as you know, I love her illustrations. I think it's so gorgeous. I think her art style suits this like horror theme so well. And this is a bit hit and miss in terms of how well I think the artwork depicts the cards. Like I said, Insight Editions are, are a bit hit and miss sometimes. Like the courts, I'm not such a fan of. The pentacle suit in this deck, unfortunately feels quite rushed and much more pippish. Whereas the other suits and the majors, for the most part, I think are much, much more, much more intentional. Um, but then this deck also has, it has my favourite judgement card of all time and one of my favourite Ten of Pentacles cards of all time. And it's just a really fun reader. It's also, I just, I find it really easy to read with this deck. Like, I don't know what it is about this deck specifically, but... It just, it's a really clear reader for me. I had to grab my favourite cards to show you because this is my video and I wanted to. This is the King of Swords, which I think is so clever as like a shadowy horror take on the, on the tarot to have this like cold, unfeeling artificial intelligence as the King of Swords, as that like air of air. I think it's really clever. Magician, Mad Scientist. That shouldn't be in there. Um, this is the Ten of Pentacles, like, generations, but the coffins, I think it's cute. And then uh, this is my favourite judgement, this, like, zombie uprising. Like, this deck is really fun, and especially for being on the cheaper end of mass market. So that is the horror tarot. Okay, here, this needs a button, but can we just take a moment? This is the second thing I have ever crocheted. I said in my New Year's resolutions video, I want to learn to crochet so I can sew crochets and tarot pouches. And I did it. The first one was a hot mess. This one 
is basically fine. It needs a button, but like, anyway, this is the Voyager Tarot, which did actually need its own bag because I got rid of the box it came in. And ooh, this is definitely still available. I assume this is the edition that is still available. This is far from the first edition. I got this, I'm gonna say a couple of years ago. And I would be surprised if you haven't heard of the Voyager Tarot. It was in, in the eighties that it was created and it's this analog collage style. It is kind of its own thing, but I think you can read it Thothy or Rider Waite Smith and you'd get on just fine. I used this as my daily pull for Sagittarius season. So I was doing a bit of a, dipping my toe into a deep dive. Um, I've got the big Oracle, Way of the Oracle guidebook. And I really loved it. The more I work with this deck, the more I love it. Um, it has keywords at the top, which I, I like how it's done because, because the keyword is separate from the title. I feel like I can ignore it or pay attention to it as I choose. It doesn't feel so much like I have to read it. Whereas if you had Child of Worlds player, it would feel like, does that make any sense? Like, I feel like I don't, I can avoid it if I want. I don't have to read it. I don't have to interpret this age of worlds as a master if I don't want to. So I love this deck. I would not be without it. It definitely kickstarted my love of analog collage decks, of which I have a fair few. There were definitely a couple in my Oracle video, as well as my Indie Tarot decks video. So, the Voyager. All right, I've got a little stack of Fournier decks. This is the Tarot del Fuego, which I'm pretty sure I've shown off a lot on this channel. Part of me wants to trim it down and part of me thinks that would be too busy, but I really hate the white borders. Anyway, I love Fournier decks. I love the size. They are smaller than standard tarot. Um, they're always on really nice cardstock and they're always cheap. And this is, this is a weird and wonderful deck. Can you tell that I like a weird and wonderful tarot? I love how kind of symbol rich and chaotic it is. It's got similar energy, especially this card with all the flames. It's got similar energy to the Bonefire Tarot. And honestly, I might have tried to pair them in, in my Bonefire unboxing. Not necessarily tried to pair them, but just see how they look together. Um, I really enjoy this. This pairs surprisingly well with a huge amount of decks that I own, which you wouldn't necessarily expect because it's so bold. But I think the... The black line work and the like primary color palette actually lends itself to pairing with a lot of different decks. So that is kind of a nice surprise about it because I like reading it on its own, but it's really fun to pair with things. So this is, this is one I've talked about a lot, so I will leave it here, but this is the Tarot del Fuego. Also by Fournier is the Tarot de El Dios de los Tres. As far as I am aware, all these Fournier decks that I have are still in print, still in production. Um, this one is fabulous and pink. And so this one, I don't, I wish the front borders were pink. I still kind of want to trim it. I just don't like a white border. Anyway, um, this one also colorful, chaotic, symbol heavy. I think it's fabulous. And um, this is more of a pip deck in the minors, but they're very, like, they're very busy pips. They're, there's a lot happening. They're not scenic, but they are, there's a lot to dig into. There's a lot to lash onto, latch onto symbolically. Um, and like here, we've got the little gravestone on the Four of Swords, which for me evokes the Rider Waite Smith. Um, I know, because it always looks like he's dead, right? It looks like a one of those tombs where they've like carved the figure into the stone. Um, it doesn't look like he's having a nap. It looks like he's dead. But anyway, <laughs> um, I think this, this moon is just fabulous. Like, I love the artwork in this deck. I love how colorful it is how bold it is. It's so much fun. And this one is really talkative. 
this is a really for me anyway I found this deck to be really easy to read and easy to read for other people with I feel like this deck is really it's very extroverted it's very chatty the third Fournier deck in my collection is the Tarot de Carla Tides. Um, I love the inside of this box and this one I don't reach for as much as the other two and I'm not quite sure why I think it's it's really lovely. It's very whimsical and kind of storybook vibes. It's got a lot of references throughout the deck. Again, this is not a traditional Rider Waite Smith or Thoth or Marseille. The meanings are quite Rider Waite Smith adjacent, but the images definitely not so much. Like we have this sword swallower for the Seven of Swords. Um, it's very, like I say, it's whimsical. It's really pretty. It has got this kind of storybook energy. I love this Two of Swords. Um, it's got a beautiful soft colour palette. It's maybe not the easiest read, but it's not difficult to read. This is Lizzie Bennett in my eyes. I don't know if it's meant to be, but for me it is. <laughs> um, yeah, but I don't reach for it quite as much as as the other two and I'm not sure why that is. It's a good springtime deck with the colour palette for sure. All right this is the Heart and Hands Tarot by Liz Blackbird and this is US Games deck. I recently got this, I got this in December and I did a walkthrough first impressions video with this. I haven't used it a whole amount since so I can't say too much about it. But the art style is super cool. It's it's all black and white. But it I think it's going to be easier to read than my other black and white decks. I mentioned this in my indie tarot deck video because I had the, the Life Lions and the Tower of the Toiling Hands. They're both black and white. And I find them, like when I, you know, lay a few cards out, I find those decks like visually just difficult to process like I can't see what I'm looking at um whereas with this I think maybe it's because the borders are bigger or the line weight is so varied like there's areas that are very filled in black and do you know what I mean like I just find it easier to look at <laughs> like I find it easier to see what I'm looking at like I put these two cards together and they looked very distinct, um, which the other black and white decks I have, not quite so much. So I need to dig the time and read this. I love the court cards in this deck. Love them. This princess of swords, this like gothy princess of swords with her combat boots. There's definitely a lot of like tattoo inspiration to the artwork, which I think just visually looks really cool. But also the direction that a lot of these cards have gone in. I also just think is really, really interesting, a little bit unique. I'll stop because I did a whole walkthrough and you can go and see my thoughts on it if you would like to see this deck in its entirety. But I think it's really, really cool and it deserves to be worked with because I think it's going to be a really cool reader. The Fifth Spirit Tarot. I talk about this all the time. This is one of my standout decks of 2023. This is just one of the hero decks in my collection. I love the artwork. This deck is by Charlie Claire Burgess and this is published by Hay House. Uh, I love the artwork. I love that it's it's pippish but not difficult to read pips. And then Charlie Claire Burgess, I just love their ethos, their approach to tarot, the way they discuss things, the way they make tarot radical and intersectional and, and really modernize it and make it relevant to so many more situations and people and and lives um I could I could wax lyrical for a long time and I have done so in other videos because their book Radical Tarot is one I haven't shut up about so I've talked about this oh this five of pentacles I've talked about this deck so much and um I don't think I will stop anytime soon but I don't need to do it here and now specifically because you've heard it before from me and you will continue to hear it but this fifth spirit is one of the absolute mass market gems of my collection 
All right, the influence of the angels tarot. This is a US games deck and the edition I have is glossy. The newer edition is linen. So you can still get your hands on this deck, but not this cardstock, which again, why would you want to when you could have a nice linen edition <laughs> cardstock? Uh, this is another digital collage reworking of existing historical classical artwork. And this deck has angels all through it. The Major Arcana, um, so here, like with justice. The Major Arcana each depict a specific angel. I don't know anything about angels. Um, it's very Christian influenced and the information is there in the guidebook. I like the images. And then you also have these little mini angels in all of the other cards. And it's really... I think it's really beautiful because I love historical artwork decks. The guidebook is actually really nice because like I say, it tells you which, like the hanged man is depicts Cassiel, apparently. Um, but then the, um, it's really nice because it tells you what the symbols in the card mean. So here in the five of pentacles, we have a winter setting, the people in the cards, the church, the pentacles themselves and then upright reverse meanings and a little angelic message which is essentially like a like an affirmation or like an oracle message an inspiration message that sort of thing so for a little white book this is actually a really nice guidebook all that being said have I worked with this deck a huge amount no and and that is why I am reluctant to get myself any more historical artwork decks because I feel like I've reached saturation point with it. Um, so I need to, I love the seven of wands, that expression is fantastic. Uh, yeah, I need to delve into this one a little bit more. One thing I will just say about the artwork, I like how it's not just like copy pasted the exact same pentacle or the exact same sword or cup across all the cards, like they are different in each of the cards. So like this six of cups, the cups in the images are different. And so they fit into the artwork more, more naturally. Like you can tell this is digitally put together and digitally collaged together, but in each of the minors, the, the suit, the element doesn't look too out of place, which I think is just a nice, a nice detail that I really appreciate. Right, I'm moving us on to the MJ Cullinane contingent. Uh, you saw her Urban Crow Oracle in my Oracle collection. You saw the Raven's Dream in my Indie deck collection. And these are her mass market decks. This one is Grimalkin's Curious Cats Tarot. Uh, this one came out, mass market at least, in the springtime, the late spring, early summer of 2023 and I jumped on this so fast. It's beautiful. Basically, that's I like her art style and I really like her guidebooks and I like the way that her decks tend to lean quite, imagery-wise, tend to lean quite positive, but her guidebooks don't gloss over the more shadowy aspects of the cards and their meanings, which I think is, is a tricky thing to do and a lot of decks don't bother doing that. Like you get a lot of kind of love and light decks and you get a lot of specifically shadowy decks, but I do find it's it's rarer to find a creator who, who is able to balance that so well. Um, and I love the way, I love the way that she does her decks. Right, this is the Enchanted Firaxa Tarot. This is her most recent mass market uh, tarot. This one is also published by Hay House. These borders are deeply disappointing to me, um, but this is very fey. I don't love the uh, human or the human-esque figures. Like there's something a little bit uncanny valley about their faces. I, de I tend to not like people in my decks, so I'm not just being rude about her artwork. I tend to prefer people not to look at me. Um, but yeah, this is this is much more fey energy, and I think this one does lean or does lend itself. Here we go, like with the ten of 
air, the Ten of Swords, it lends itself to those more shadowy aspects and interpretations really easily, even though a lot of the image isn't necessarily deep and dark and mysterious, but there is still depth to it. I fear I am rambling at this point. We have the Guardian of the Night Tarot, which is another Hay House deck and is the one that started it all for MJ Cullinane decks for me. I edged it in this blue, which you can see has been absolutely destroyed with how much I've shuffled it, so I definitely need to top it up. Um, but yeah, this was my first MJ Cullinane deck. And it was the six of pentacles in this deck that really uh, kind of seduced me and won me over to her decks. And the six of pentacles actually, I don't think is in this deck because you might have noticed that my Hay House ones were not filling the box quite full. It's because I kind of Frankenstein together the ultimate MJ Cullinane deck. <laughs> and that is actually sitting in a tarot pouch next to my bed. I think I filmed that actually, but I never put it up. So I do have footage of me picking my favourite card out of her three Hay House decks and then building my ultimate MJ Cullinane tarot. So let me know if you want to see that because I can definitely make that make that happen, actually put it on YouTube. But anyhow, this is the Guardian of the Night. I love how that, even though her art style is the same and it's evolved, but it's 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 the same art style as this digital artwork. I love how the aesthetics of each deck are very distinct and this one is set at night time and then all these like little fireflies and like the stars in this deck. It's all like, it, it, it makes me think of like fairy lights almost, like it's so pretty. So even though this is night time, this deck is very cosy. And then my final MJ Cullinane deck is the Crow Tarot. This one is published by US Games. And I want to say maybe this was her earliest tarot deck, but I truly, I could be making that up. But again, I, th I feel like her art style looks like it came earlier than her other decks that I've got. But who knows? I'm making things up here. This is, this, I feel like, this is a beloved deck of Tarot Tube. Um, and I can see why, because this is a really, this is a really great deck to read with. And it strikes a balance of being intense and blunt and kind of telling you what you need to hear, but does it in a way that feels kind? Like it's not brutal. It's just not softening things or holding things back. This is another deck, as I'm, as I'm doing these videos, I'm like, God, I really need to pull this deck out more. And that list is growing. Um, but yeah, this one is all crows. This one, surprisingly, is not my favorite to pair with the Urban Crow Oracle. I think the art styles are a little bit different, but this is a really special deck and I think this deck in particular of hers strikes a balance between the crows looking like they're acting like crows and also like here with this queen of pentacles like embodying the the human archetypes that we're used to seeing in the tarot which I think is is very cleverly done so that is the crow tarot. All right this is the dragon tarot which I don't think this deck is out of print. I got my copy on eBay and I think the big guidebook that came with it, I think that edition might be out of print, but I think this deck is still in print. Um, and who, this is a US Games deck. When were we first published? Just because I'm curious. First published in 1996, so um, I think I think it's still kicking. Anyway, this is a dragon tarot. <laughs> this is illustrated by Peter Prokonik, who I love, and I have three decks that he has illustrated, and there is a tarot oracle on my wish list, and then I think I have them all. But this is so 90s. This is so 90s fantasy. It reminds me of 
I don't know, it just feels very nostalgic. My dad was a, has always been quite techy and was a big gamer and into fantasy. So I feel like this vibe kind of permeated my childhood a little bit because he'd have, have it in games or in artwork or whatever when I went to visit him. So this feels really nostalgic. I also love dragons. I'm also a fantasy person. Um, and I just think it's so, so beautiful. I love this art style. This is a little bit pippish, but I think it works really well. The sword suit all have these like bubbles in, which I think are really cute. And um, it's a lovely deck. Also, I've only just noticed that the elemental association for the lover's card is a little heart, which is absolutely adorable. So I'm gonna leave this one there. All right, the Tarot Nuage by Nademan. This is US Games. This is US Games. Um, and this has some Marseille vibes to it. First of all, the art style is so cool. It's really kind of grungy and spiky. Um, and I just think it's really, really cool. I love the color palette. I love this little penguin. And like, it's not a Marseille deck. But I think in the majors, it's it's a fair bit Marseille inspired, and again, it's got this like fantasy, grungy fantasy aesthetic. Something about this also feels quite nostalgic to me, and I truly am not sure what it is, but I think it's so cool. To, truth be told, this is one that I have because I think the art is cool, not because I really read with it a whole ton. Like here, this is a much more Marseille Lovers. Um, maybe that's where I was getting that from. So I probably do need to play with this a little bit more and decide if it is going to stay in my collection long term because I really did just buy it because I think the artwork is cool. In the pips, we've got these like bees and mushrooms in the coins. Um, or like mushroom people. <laughs> um, it's penguins in the cups and then these like little impy things in the wands and maybe also the swords. So it's a very cool deck. I really like the art style. The New Chapter Tarot by Catherine Briggs. This is a Liminal 11 deck so it has the irritating box um first off I love the size of this deck it's perfect but it is a liminal 11 deck so the box is annoying the cardstock is kind of crap and the guidebook like they always do these nice little hardback guidebooks but then there's not very much information in them this one is better than most I will say that. And I feel like, oh, there's a foreword by Rachel Pollack. The guidebook itself isn't written by Rachel Pollack. I haven't read this guidebook, I'm going to be honest with you, because I don't usually care for Liminal 11 guidebooks. But anyhow, um, this is the new chapter tarot, and this is, this is just very cool. I really like the, the watercolory style and I like how in the pips, like it feels fothy because there's so much geometry going on. And like I say, I've not read the guidebook. I don't know if there was a lot of foth inspiration for this deck or what. This Ace of Cups is so, so beautiful. Um, but there's a lot of, yeah, a lot of geometry happening in all the cards honestly but especially in the pips like it's just beautiful it's so stunning um I feel like I've neglected this deck because the box is huge and so it kind of gets shoved behind other things doing these videos doing these collection videos I've had to take everything out from where I keep it and I've just separated them by like oracle indie tarot mass market tarot to make sure I haven't left anyone out so once I finished filming I can put everything back and I might do a bit of a reshuffle to try and bring some neglected decks to the front. Like this Hermit is fantastic. Like I think the artwork is so, so cool and I just need to read with it some more because it deserves it. 
and I think this is one that looks that looks really good when you've got several cards out in a spread which is important and I think when I was first first getting into tarot first buying tarot decks I was watching walkthroughs and I was thinking okay does the ace of pentacles fit what I think an ace of pentacles should mean does the two of pentacles I was looking at card by card like is this a good card or a bad card do I like this card or not um and not necessarily thinking about how would these cards look in a spread together and would I be able to read it um and these look so good and spread together because I think again because of that that geometry that's present in a lot of the cards you can draw a lot of parallels so the new chapter tarot all right this is the smith Waite centennial edition in a tin i talked about this in my decks i don't use video because i don't use this to read with i use it as reference which is why it is in order and you know this is the centennial smith Waite. what more needs to be said um i don't love the rider Waite smith original artwork i appreciate it and like I say, I have this for reference, but it's not my favourite, so I don't really ever read with this. I have the Queen of Swords living in my phone case under an avocado sticker. Um, I, I don't use it, don't read with this, but I do like to have it to reference. I like to have it to compare to a new deck, if the new deck is right away Smith based, just to kind of look for parallels, look for differences, look for changes. It's a really useful deck to have, and I think if you buy a lot of tarot decks, if you read with a lot of different decks, I think that you probably should have a copy of the Rider Waite Smith because it has been the inspiration for so many decks. But I don't read with this. All right, Navigator's Tarot of the Mystic Sea. This one is out of print. It was published by US Games. I got myself a copy of eBay. These are the backs with the Tree of Life. And when was this originally published? 1997. I always think it was earlier than that, but this was a 1997 deck. And this is just so very cool. It's another one that has a keyword, but again, like the Voyager Tarot, because the keyword is at the top and is separate from the title. I feel like I can take it or leave it. I can read with it if I want to, if that makes sense in the reading that I'm doing, but I don't have to, which I appreciate. This Queen of Pentacles is so beautiful. I love the art style. I think this is a really, a really cool, really special deck. This is a deck that feels like it has its own, like its own world building its own set setting like I feel like this is a deck that was envisioned and then created to fit that vision like a little bit like the Tower of Vampires rather than a deck that was created to fulfill a brief because US Games said hey we want to hire you to do 78 cards like do you know what I mean oh this Empress is so fantastic there were just such beautiful cards in this deck I love the colors and I love all the little details, like it's just, it's so lovely. Again, there's a lot of kind of geometry to these images too. I wonder if it would work with the new chapter or if that would be a bit much. Um, incidentally, this is also like, it's a really nice little size. Oh my God, I left the Queen of Swords in the box. How? Because the Queen of Swords is me, right? It's my Libra card. Um, so that's... That's interesting that it was the card left behind in the box. Don't know how I feel about that. <laughs> the Queer Tarot by Ash and Jess. Uh, this one, oh god, I hate the box and I hate the cardstock. Um, this one, I believe, is still in print. Of course, I love this hot pink lining. Uh, I spoke about this card in my Tarot Backs and Borders video that I did, just showing off my favourite Backs and Borders because... I love the colours. I love the way colour is used in this deck in general. It's a Rider Waite Smith clone, but redrawn and featuring queer people. The creators are queer, and I believe that the figures, the people in this deck, were modelled by real life queer people, which I think is a very clever way 
to ensure that your deck is reflecting like the real community like I think that's clever I think there's probably I mean 78 cards is a limited number of people so I don't know if it is possible for any one deck to accurately reflect the diversity of a community as large as as the queer community but I think the fact that they have modeled these figures on real life queer people is is definitely a good way to go talking about colors it's very bright it's very vibrant vibrant it's very very rainbowy which you would expect I think from from a queer tarot deck but I love the way that the texture of the colors is done I love the way that they're kind of like they look faded they look like there's been some like noise or grain added over or they look like they've been like screen printed and the texture just it for me at least it really adds to the feel of this deck like being a queer person myself I really appreciate having a deck that is made by queer people featuring queer people like for queer tarot readers like I appreciate that this exists and the texture of this like faded like they look like sun faded colors something about that alone makes this deck feel very cozy and comforting so like it kind of adds up to make this deck just feel very very comforting for me which like I would not necessarily have expected because I think this is more of like a celebration of queer people it's more of like a this feels more like a pride month deck whereas something like the fifth spirit which also is by a queer creator featuring queer people that feels more like that feels more like a deck that might nurture me or might be a resource for queer people like does that make sense so this is like a pride month deck it's bright it's loud it's colorful we're here we're queer but the nature of the way the colors are done also makes it feel very like cozy to me which is which is cool which is nice anyway that is the queer tarot. Okay, the Lord of the Rings tarot deck and card game. This is a US games deck. This one, I don't think this is in print anymore. I think this one is out of print. I got my copy secondhand off eBay and I got an edition that came with um, like a bigger book. So yeah, it's a, it's a card game, but I have not played it as a card game. Um, this is also illustrated by Peter Prokonik, and it is it's a it's a Lord of the Rings deck. So you can tell it's meant to be used as a as a card game. It's got these symbols up in the corner. Like I say, I've not played this card game, so I don't know what they pertain to. But each scene is a scene from The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings. We've got a little blurb. The sun shines over the Shire where everything is growing in harmony. And this is the sun card. And for the most part, I think they've been chosen really well. Um, oh God, I love this. Like, I wish that these were full-size cards. Although I I really like this setup and the, the gradient background and this brickwork. Again, it feels very like a 90s video game. And it's very nostalgic and I love it a great deal. But I do also wish that we had these as full size cards because I love Peter Bacronick's artwork. So it's a Lord of the Rings themed tarot. And I do like these little like blurbs, kind of hints as to what exactly is is being depicted in the card. And it gives you a bit of the meaning of the tarot card, which yeah, for the most part, I think they work really well like oh, Sam carrying Frodo for the Ten of Wands. It's perfect. Anyhow, I love this deck a lot. I know there are more Lord of the Rings tarot decks out there. Like I know there's there's one that has like woodcut artwork, which is cool, but I like this one. Fairy Tarot by Natalie Hertz. Um, I edged this myself. It doesn't come all rainbowy like this. I swear I thought this was out of print but 
it's not. <laughs> US Games is still printing this as far as I'm aware. I got my copy like secondhand, but um, I'm, I'm sure that it is in fact still in print. Anyhow, this is, this is by Natalie Hertz. I've got another one of her decks. I want another, another one of her decks. I love her art style. It's kind of spiky. Like this is fairies, but make them spiky. This feels like fairy energy that is kind of a cross between like full trickster fae and like flower fairies. Like this feels like a midpoint. Like it's a bit cheeky. It's got a lot of personality, but it's not. It doesn't feel like Faye that I've got to be really careful about, you know? Um, and I think it's beautiful. I love all the colors. I love that the borders are all different colors. And I also just really like the depictions. I think for the most part, they're done really well. And even when they're, like this is a pretty standard two of swords, but even when the imagery is quite removed from the Rideaway Smith images that I'm used to, I think they read really well. I also really like these illustrated borders in the, is it just in the pip cards or is it throughout? Where's a major when you need one? Yeah, so I know it is throughout like this, this mushroom for the tower and this ice queen, queen of swords. It's a lovely fun deck. I'm going to do my other tin decks because I keep trying to grab the centennial which I have already shown you. This is Barbara Walker Tarot in a tin published by US Games. Still in print as far as I am aware. I don't know if the uh, full size version is in print though. I think that might be why I have the tin. Um, but this is also kind of spiky artwork. A famously a deck that is a bit mean <laughs> and not very polite and this one oh, I love this death card also has the title and then a keyword up top in the minors and the courts as you can see the majors are just numbered and then the major title um I don't feel comfortable or confident reading with this deck yet and I don't know having doom up here is not really helping me <laughs> but I don't know if that is because it is a tricksy reader like here we've got the ace of swords like the aces are usually pretty positive and then the keyword is doom we've got a little skull goblet like there's a lot happening so I don't know if the reason I don't feel comfy with it is is because it is a harsher reader or if it is because I have heard everybody else say that this is a a mean deck and so I've kind of put that barrier up without actually giving myself a chance to see how I get on with this deck. So I'm not sure. It needs more attention. I love a vicious queen of swords. Yeah, I need to give this one more attention for sure. Um, and really get to grips with it because I love the artwork. I think this is such a wonderful deck. But yes. My final mini tin deck is the Wild Unknown Pocket Tarot and I'm honestly surprised that this is the only of her only deck of hers that I have in my collection at this point but um I did not expect to ever get this deck because it was so hyped when it first came out and as a newbie to tarot I was like I don't know how I'm gonna read this like it's it's very uh, sparse it's very stripped back it's animals it doesn't make sense to me I don't think I like it and then years later I'm like mm, I'm curious I want to see how I feel about it so I did a video actually I, I um ugh. I eventually will stop tripping over my words I unboxed and flipped through this deck on camera and I have ended up really, really liking it. Again, similar to the Raven's Prophecy, it's stripped back in a way that does not strip back meaning. The imagery is stripped back, but especially in the pips, I was really surprised by how much I like the pips in this deck. The majors, the chords, I'm not so fussed about. But like, like this is such an effective Seven of Swords because you almost don't see that Seventh Sword and this fox with like one eye open keeping its eye on you, like, 
I just think it's so, it's so well done. I really enjoy this. And um, like I say, I think more Kim Crowns decks are in my future. All right, we have another Liminal 11 Nightmare box. Um, I wish, I wish they did a tuck box and then spent that money on some decent cardstock. Like this is a glossy nightmare. This is the Cosmic Slumber Tarot and this has been in and out of my like working tarot deck library so many times because I think it's beautiful. I think the colours are absolutely stunning. The illustration work is gorgeous. I can't read with this deck. <laughs> um, I have I have such beef with the courts in particular because they all look the same. Like within the suit, they all look the same as each other. Like I think the swords in particular, the queen and the king are like almost identical images. I don't know how I'm supposed to tell the difference between them. Like this is the Prince of Cups, which I think is the knight. Because another odd thing this deck was, did was it's, the, the figures are for the most part pretty like androgynous looking. I think the uh, creator, I think the creator is non-binary. Um, but at the very least, I think an intention of this deck was to remove some of the uh, traditional assigned genders of the cards. But then they renamed Page and Knight to Princess and Prince, which I thought was an odd choice, but hey. Like, look at these colors. They're so beautiful. But like, this doesn't say Ten of Pentacles to me. The court, the, um, the majors are pretty good. Like, this is Three of Cups, for sure. Like, some of them make sense. I really like this Ace of Swords with this little person on the sword hilt. But, like, I just find it really hard to read, and the courts really bother me. So, the reason this has been back in and out of my working deck collection is I really like how it pairs with a lot of other decks, which really surprised me. Okay, here's my prime issue. So the princess is the page, the prince is the knight. Why is the princess the one who is in motion and flying through the air? It does not make sense to me. Anyhow, like it's really beautiful. It pairs really nicely with other decks. I love the art style. I want to love it. But like half the cards just don't make very much sense to me. Although I do really like this justice. I don't know. I need to work out my issues with this deck. <laughs> the Vampire Tarot. This is the other Natalie Hertz deck that I've got and this one is out of print. Um, and I love it. If you couldn't already tell, I feel like this video would show you that I love a weird and wonderful deck that's kind of colourful and chaotic and I also love a like campy gothy kind of a vibe so like aesthetically this is very different from the tarot of vampires the Llewellyn deck that I've got but they both like really lean into their chosen aesthetic and I really appreciate that um oh, this fool is so good like this is such a fun deck to work with but also can get like really deep and really quite intense it depends depends what you're asking I've read with this paired with the urban crow oracle um I did that for a bit which was like very intense very very not chill but um I reckon that on its own you can kind of lean into the the camp of it a little bit more um, so yeah, that is the Vampire Tarot. All right, the Deviant Moon. Uh, this is the Borderless Edition by Patrick Valenza. This is pubbed by US Games. This is still in print. I really, really wish that they would print his other decks mass market because I can't afford to ship them over from the States. Like they're expensive decks indeed, like the Triomphe de la Luna. It's an expensive indie deck and the shipping is wild so I'm not going to get my hands on that unless it goes mass market but anyway about this deck <laughs> this is like a very this is another one that when I first saw it years ago I was like oh that's freaky I don't like it and then I came back around I was like actually yes I do like it because it's freaky 
and um, this one's really cool because it looks like very dark and moody and grungy but the pops of colour in this are actually really bright and really vivid and that makes it really fun to pair with other decks. I also really appreciate the fact that it is kind of weird and wonderful and and a little bit creepy like there's a lot of the more stylized something is um like it can go one of two ways it can either just be a really bad interpretation of the tarot or it can be really stylized and then that's an opportunity for the artist to add in loads of extra symbolism and kind of make up their own symbolic language which makes for a really fun reading experience and I think this is definitely that latter category like it's been very very intentional really lent into the the art style that he's got going on and really made it work with the tarot the tarot of the dream enchantress this is a low scarabeo deck and i think this is the first low scarabeo deck that i've shown you and maybe the only low scarabeo in my collection which seems wild because i feel like i should have more of their decks i don't understand it anyway this is a very blue green deck. Um, this is fantasy vibes. It's got these like fey, elfy type people. Most of the figures in this deck are like feminine figures and the like traditionally like male roles like the Hierophant and the Kings, they're all masked, which I think is an interesting choice. I don't really have much preference one way or the other. I know there are a lot of decks out there that focus on like female characters, um, characters, people, women. <laughs> and I don't really have thoughts one way or the other on if I like that or not. Like it is what it is. I don't have a particular preference, but um, I think it's interesting what they've done with the masks in this deck. But um, I like this for its fantasy aesthetic. This also has like my favourite Queen of Swords of all time which I don't think I'll be able to find to show you but just trust me when I say it's fantastic. This is um, this is a really cool deck to work with because it also because it's got that fantasy kind of setting it's got its own world building it's got quite a strong sense of setting and sense of place it's got a lot of atmosphere which I really really enjoy uh, especially doing like a slightly bigger spread or working with it for like a longer period of time you can get really immersed in the world that it's building which is really fun so that is the tarot of the dream enchantress all right the morgan greer tarot this is a 70s deck this is us games still in print i can't believe that i didn't have this deck prior to this year because partly because it's such a classic partly because I have wanted it for a long time and partly because I think this was on my standout decks list. I love this deck. I love the way it reads. I love how kind of strong and punchy and to the point it is. I love the colours, the bright vivid colours. I love the art style. I love how we're so zoomed in on um, like the figures in this deck. Like here we're just seeing these like joined hands in the Ten of Cups and we're very like zoomed in on the people and I feel like that adds to the the intensity and the straight to the point quality of this deck. Um, I absolutely would not be without this in my collection. I think it's a really, this is one of those decks that I have taken to grabbing to just chuck in my bag if I want to take a deck out with me or I want to do a reading. I don't want to spend hours poring over a guidebook or trying to decipher a meaning. This is one of the decks that I go to. It's fantastic. All right, the Midnight Magic Tarot. This came out in 2023. This is a Sh Simon and Schuster deck. The box is too big. It's frustrating. Ooh. This is another one that I'm like, I need to pull this out more because I think it's beautiful. The art style is beautiful. I love the black backgrounds with these kind of hazy colors. It's, I mean, it's called Midnight Magic, so it has that kind of nighttime kind of dreamy vibe kind of moonlit everything's a little bit hazy like it's it's beautiful I also just 
I'm so impressed by how a deck featuring mushrooms is able to convey the tarot meanings quite so effectively. Like, don't get me wrong, like some of them like are a little bit of a stretch. Like this is not obviously a six of swords, but when you kind of look into it, and this is aquatic, so it's an underwater mushroom. So you've got that water that you're used to seeing in the six of swords. Like it's so well done. It's so well thought out. The guidebook is really good. It tells you what mushroom has been chosen and why that mushroom fits the theme of the tarot. I worked with this for about a month and I pulled the queen of wands constantly and it's just gorgeous. I'm just now connecting the dots between this and the Herb Crafters Tarot because I also said about that guidebook that it really, really eloquently, in also a quite a short space of, of guidebook, it connects the plant with the meaning of the deck without talking down to you. Like it doesn't say the meaning of the card is this, the meaning of the plant is this, and this is why it works. Like it just it just explains it so well. So maybe I shouldn't be surprised that I like the Herb Crafter so much because I've really enjoyed working with this one. And now I'm like, ooh, can I use them together? Is that a thing I can do? Anyway, Midnight Magic. The Hobbit Tarot. This is my third Peter Prokonik deck. Uh, this is a US Games deck, but this one is out of print. This one is, is not impossible to get hold of, but I did have to wait a while until I found one that was a price I was willing to pay. There were a few that were like 50, 60 quid and then this one feels brand new and I think I paid less than 20 quid for it. But anyway, this is the Hobbit equivalent of the full-size art that I wanted from the Lord of the Rings tarot. So it's very similar vibes because the artist is the same, the world that it's drawn from is the same, but this one is set up like a more traditional tarot. It doesn't have the um, additional game element to it. This one, um, again, we've got like a scene from the Hobbit story, which is used to depict the the energy, the theme of the tarot card. And it is outlined in the guidebook, which scene is shown on each card, which I really appreciate. It's not quite as spot on for all of the cards as the Lord of the Rings tarot is, but I think that's probably because The Hobbit is a much, much shorter story than the Lord of the Rings. So there's kind of less to choose from. Um, but for the most part, I think it works really well. As we've established, I love the art because I love the t this artist's work. And I really enjoy reading with this. It's a really kind of cozy, like low stress deck for me because that's what The Hobbit is for me. The Hobbit is quite nostalgic, very cozy. Um, so I really like I really like this deck for that same like feeling, especially with the color palette with a lot of these like nighttime kind of blues. Like it just feels very, I say that as I come across the judgment card, but the deck as a whole feels quite low stress. It's really nice. Okay, we are getting there. This is my Thoth Tarot. Um, this is published by AGM. I'm not sure, got the boxes falling apart. I'm not sure exactly what edition this is. It has this artwork, <laughs> which I think is the um, Prince of Swords, it must be. Is it the Prince of Swords? Anyway, um, this one is in order because I have been using it for my deck and walk and for reference. I do not yet feel confident enough to read with the Thoth Tarot, but again, that is something on my giant list of goals for this year. Um, I love the Thoth artwork and I really want to kind of dig into all of the different symbolism, all the esoteric stuff, and I love the pips in the Thoth Tarot. I just think, I think they're so beautiful and having spent a little bit more time with this, I feel much less intimidated by a pip deck in general. And I think the the colors and the shapes really do evoke the, the meaning of the cards. So when I first started reading tarot, I feel like that's probably the same for anyone who started reading with the Rider Waite Smith. When you see your first Marseille or your first Thoth deck, it's a bit like, what the hell is that? How do I read? Like three cups and get all that all those keywords from it but um having actually spent a little bit more time with this as well as feeling more confident in tarot as a whole than when I first started 
I, I'm excited to get to grips with this. Um, oh, I love this. I love this Seven of Cups. I think it's fantastic. So yeah, uh, Lady Frida Harris's work is, is beautiful and I can't wait to really dig in. Uh, this is whatever size this is and I want a large edition and I want to chop the borders off so it's just the artwork. I can't remember, I saw somebody had done that on their YouTube channel. It's possible that it was Honey Lou because she has an incredible floth deck collection but um, it could easily have been somebody else. But I would really like to have like a second larger deck with just the artwork because like I I like the cards, I don't dislike the borders, I like having uh, the titles and the symbols and the yeah the titles and the minors as well but I just think the art's so beautiful I really would like to have a, a bigger version so I can see the art better and I think I'd really like to have a borderless copy. Since we've just done Thoth, I'm going to do my Mass Market Marseille decks. This is the Squid Cake Marseille Tarot. This came out in 23. It's published by Rockpool. Um, this was an indie deck originally. And I talk about this all the time because look how cute it is. Look how cute this deck is. I love it. Um, I don't know why I'm turning it upside down. <laughs> uh, so this kicked off my Marseille study, my interest in other non Rider Waite Smith systems. I picked this up on a bit of a whim. I spoke about this already in my standout decks video, so I'll keep it brief, but I picked this up on a whim and then I was really, really pleasantly surprised with how much I enjoyed reading this and how it kind of led me on to the Marseille system in general and exploring other things and deepening, deepening my practice or broadening my practice, expanding my practice. We'll go with that. So that is the Squid Cake. This guidebook is also really good considering it's the whole deck is like a really dinky little setup. This guidebook is, is short and sweet and it really is a really good guidebook. The final Marseille I have in my collection at this moment, I have another one, a Kickstarter deck coming in a few months, but this is another Fournier deck. And this is the Spanish Tarot. And I forget where I first saw this. I'm sure that this was a YouTube made me do it. But I don't remember where I first saw this. I think I wanted, because I've got the Dinosaur Marseille, which was in my Indie Tarot deck video. And I've obviously got the Squid Cake. And I wanted one that was much more traditional. And I was looking, I was essentially, I was looking for a cheap copy because I, I know which very luxe reproductions I want but they are quite expensive and I didn't want to be spending that much money so in this one the colours have been altered from the like early original printings but the art style is much the same and although the colours are more vivid and more saturated the um the way it's set up is the same as a traditional Marseille and it certainly is much closer than my dinosaur deck or my squid cake deck so I like having this in my collection. This is, I'm kind of gearing up for some Marseille study this year. Like I say, I do my Marseille for May. I say I do that. I did that last year and I plan to continue it. It's it's not as much of a tradition as they make it sound, but uh, this is gonna be my main like study deck. And then the Squid Cake and the Dinosaur Marseille are also really fun to work with. But I love the colors in this. I love the saturation. I. Also, it's a Fournier deck, so the cardstock's nice, and I love that Fournier size. And um, I also, this sounds really picky, but I like the colour of the backgrounds, because it's off-white, but it's not too creamy, and it's not, it's not a stark white, so I just think this looks really lovely. The penultimate deck in my mass market tarot collection. This is the Crystal Visions Tarot. Uh, this is a US Games one. This is still in print, as far as I'm aware. I have so many US Games decks. I I don't know why I'm surprised by that because they're a major publisher, but I still can't believe I've only got one low scarabay. That's wild to me. Anyway, there is a walkthrough of this on my channel in the same video that I unboxed the Wild Unknown Tarot because this was another deck that I never thought I'd buy because it's this kind of softer, fey kind of energy. It's Similar to the um, Dreams of Gaia, to me, in the sense that it's this very earthy, mystical, magical kind of vibe to it. Like, it's very beautiful. And 
I just I never thought that would be something I would be into but unsurprisingly the more I have worked with tarot and the kind of deeper I've got with tarot over the years the more I'm interested in different art styles different takes that I previously wouldn't have been interested in because now I know a little bit more I feel like I can appreciate these different takes anyhow this has a lot of fey energy to me but in contrast to the Natalie Hertz fairies tarot where they're kind of cheeky spiky a little bit garden fairy a little bit trickster fae this one feels much more like almost like elven like I I would I would put these adjacent to the kind of Lord of the Rings elves like they're very beautiful and powerful and graceful like that's kind of what this feels like it's also absolutely gorgeous I think this is such a beautiful beautiful deck I love the art style I love all the color choices part of me wants to chop the borders off because I think I think it doesn't need the borders. I wouldn't mind if they were black, but I think it doesn't, I think this would work quite nicely borderless because the colors are fairly similar across, like the, the depth, the saturation is fairly similar and it wouldn't be too chaotic, I think borderless. So part of me wants to chop it down, but that's a future decision. So this is the Crystal Visions Tarot. And I've really been enjoying this and I'm glad that I that I have it in my collection, that I have this kind of energy in my collection. I love this Page of Swords. All right, we've made it to the final deck that I have to show you today. And this is the Russian Tarot of St. Petersburg. Uh, this is yet another US Games deck. I believe this one is still in print. I have no reason to suspect that it's not, beyond the fact that it's a bit of an older deck, I think. Yeah, copyright 1992 but I feel like this is still in print. Anyway, um, this is in a similar vein. It's not a historical art deck like the Influence of the Angels or uh, the Golden Tarot, but it has that same kind of vibe because it's, it's set in a particular time and place and the styling of the borders and the artwork fits that so it has the same kind of same kind of coziness to it. This is a very cozy feeling deck. And I just, first of all, I do love the borders. I can't believe this didn't go in my tarot borders that I love video because I think they're fantastic. Um, and I just, I love the artwork. I love the colors. I love the suns and the moons in this deck. I think they're fantastic. Like this Ace of Coins is absolutely beautiful. And although they're quite small, I think the images, um, they run parallel to the Rider Waite Smith. They're just in this, in this art style with this like Russian influence, but they're just beautiful. And I really like reading with this. It's another like comfy, cozy reader. And because it's so, so close to the Rider Waite Smith, I find it really quite like easy and straightforward to read. So. This is one that I think should live next to my bed because I think it's a good like wind down and the black backgrounds make me think of nighttime obviously and it's just like isn't it isn't it beautiful so the Russian Tarot of St Petersburg is the final deck that I have in this series of videos next week I'm talking about all of my tarot books and then this little mini series, this mini collection series, will be complete. I don't like finishing on the Nine of Swords there. That's something we be more cheerful. There we go, the chariot. This one has been very long, so thank you so much for watching. If you've stuck with me this long, I really hope you've enjoyed. As always, let me know what you think in the comments down below. If there's a deck that I've shown that you want me to give you a walkthrough or, or like a little review type video, tell you my thoughts on let me know because I love to show off my lovely collection as you can tell and with that I'm going to leave you thank you so much for watching give me a like if you liked it subscribe if you haven't already and I will see you in the next one Bye bye